My experience with parapsychology. I remember being stopped in my tracks with confusion and fear. Was I dreaming? Has I hallucinated? I was about eight or nine years old at the time and I had been sleeping peacefully in my room. My bed was against the wall with the foot of my bed just inches away from my door. In my small bedroom where I had been resting, I reached over to my nightstand where my glasses lay. After donning my less than fashionable visual aid, I peered across the hall into the bedroom that was shared by my two younger sisters. I often looked out the window of the bedroom from my soft perch across the hallway and would watch the leaves of the trees outside dance in the wind. I would watch the shadows that were created due to the illumination of the streetlight across the way in the neighbor's yard. I would try and find shapes and patterns in the shadows. However, this time I didn't see a shadow. I clearly saw my mother standing there, peering out the window. Her head was leaning upon her arm, which was raised upward against the window frame. It looked as if she was upset about something. I rolled out of my bed and made my way into my sister's bedroom, still with my mother in clear sight. Upon entering my sister's sleeping quarters, I flipped on the light and my mother disappeared. I rubbed my eyes and pinched myself to make sure I was awake and not dreaming. Without a shadow of a doubt, I was wide awake. I stood there and wondered, what had just happened to me? What had I just seen? It was the year 1999, and I had recently completed basic training in order to become a professional wrestling referee. I was working my first ever event at the Palladium in Worcester, Massachusetts. I was in the wrestling ring officiating a tag team match in front of over 600 people. Approximately five minutes into the match, I happened to glance over at the corner of the ring behind me to ensure that the competitor on the outside was holding onto the tag rope, which he is required to remain in contact with until he is tagged by his partner. At that point, I felt it as if I had walked into a wall of heavy air. In some ways, the feeling was similar to one that you get when you glance across a room and find an attractive person staring in your direction and they wink at you. I glanced over the professional wrestler's shoulder and noticed an apparition on the stage behind us. I couldn't make out the form well enough to know whether or not it was a man or a woman. For a split second I thought perhaps it was a shadow, but I soon realized it had three dimensions. The apparition held my attention for at least ten seconds before the professional wrestler in the corner as well as the one in the wrestling ring at the time called me by name to try and get my attention back on the match. I snapped out of my confused trance and wondered. What had just happened to me? What had I just seen? Sometime during the next year, I was at a house currently being lived in by my aunt and her family. The house was once a dwelling of my great-grandmother, whom died several years prior. The majority of the family was outside in the backyard enjoying a refreshing dip in the swimming pool, while others were sitting around a table discussing the nuances of their lives with each other. I realized that I was quite parched and made my way into the kitchen where my mother and her sister, my aunt, were preparing food for the others and having a discussion. I headed to the water cooler, which was against the wall on the opposite side of the kitchen. As I reached for a cup from the dispenser that was hanging on the side of the cooler, I got the feeling that there was someone else there besides the three of us. I slowly turned my head towards an open pantry and noticed an entity that looked like it was out of place in time, yet as if it belonged there at the same time. I saw what appeared to be a middle-aged man in 1950 clothing, attempting to find a cure for his hunger. The image lasted all of a few seconds. However, I was able to describe to my mother and aunt what I had just seen a few seconds earlier. They both told me that I had described my great-grandfather to the exact letter. He passed away unexpectedly in the 1950s, and there were no pictures of him in existence that I had ever seen, yet I was able to articulate his appearance so exactly. I walked away and I had asked myself, what had just happened to me? What had I just seen? Several years later, I was working a security and safety gig at the local mall in Auburn, Massachusetts. I worked third shift and was frequently visited by the local constabulary, whom were looking to pass the time as the town had little crime. It came time to do my hourly tour of the premises, and one of Auburn's finest decided to take a walk with me. Part of my tour took me to an outside electrical room that housed the fire alarm system for the entire mall. Part of my delegated duties was to check the panel on the system to ensure that there were no trouble alarms in the system. The door to the electric room was in a court with a half dozen other doors leading to the hallway and the tenants of the mall. 
and this court was a dumpster. I had made it a habit of making sure the dumpster was secured properly as the local wildlife found their way into the dumpster where they would end up injured by broken glass and chemicals that were often disposed of incorrectly by staff of the stores in the mall. I circled the dumpster and felt a strange sensation of fear come over me. Being someone who rarely feels fear, I stopped in my tracks and focused on a form that was lying on the ground before me. I couldn't make out a face as the vision was blurry, but it appeared to me a man who was bleeding severely. The image lasted only a few seconds and ceased when the police officer grasped my arm and asked if I was okay. I described what I had seen to him and he informed me that sometime earlier in the previous decade, the police had gunned down a suspect who was running from them and had threatened an officer with a weapon. He had passed away right where I was standing. Again, I stood there and on questioned myself. What had just happened to me? What had I just seen? Over a period of six years in the late 1990s to early 2000s, I had a reoccurring dream. At least twice a week, I would dream about a young girl whom I would see standing in the basement of my house. She looked petrified and was trying to protect herself from something. She would arrange her fingers in a diamond formation and I would see a beam of light emanating from the center of the diamond. The beam would cross the basement and hit what appeared to be a large head floating in front of the basement door and lead to the backyard. I couldn't make out the face very well, however, the presence frightened the young girl to the point of panic. I remember attempting lucid dreaming, which I had learned years earlier while taking cognitive behavioral therapy. All that I was ever able to get out of the girl was that her name was Sarah. I had begun exploring these visions that I was having in general and made the decision to do some research about the property. After seeking land records and the help of a local historian, I found that the whole area was a cemetery in the distant past. The graves are marked with small round stones no bigger than a softball. After a season of violent storms, some of the grave markers had washed away. Town government had decided to exhume all of the caskets and move them to the cemetery on the other side of town. However, due to poor record keeping and the fact that some of the grave markers had washed away, it was believed that some of the remains of the people who had been buried there were missed and not moved with the rest of them. I found documents that stated that a young girl named Sarah who had died at the age of eight had been buried near where my house had been later built and that her casket was one of the few that were not found. When I found out this information, I once again asked myself, what was happening to me? What I had just seen? These stories are just a few of the countless unexplainable visions I had in my lifetime. As I grew older, I realized that I was not actually physically seeing these scenes as if they were in corporeal form, but was envisioning them in my mind as if my subconscious was painting me a picture, trying to make sense of something. What that something was, I was not sure of for the longest time. It wasn't until 2009 that I began empirical research into this ability that I seemed to have. I learned that I had what was known as retrocognition clairvoyance, the ability to see into the past. I have come to believe that I am somehow able to pick up residual energy that is left after a traumatizing or very emotional incident and my mind is able to give that feeling an image in my mind. Until that time period, I had kept my ability a secret out of fear of being judged, labeled, and due to the fact that any time I told someone in the past, they thought that I was insane and should be committed. Very few people had believed me. The small list would contain my mother, one of my sisters, and one or two friends. Over time, I began to surround myself with people who did not judge me and took me for my word. They believed what I was saying, and that alone made me feel much better. I joined a group of people who shared similar abilities and was ecstatic to find out that I wasn't alone. Once I was able to stop hiding from my abilities and admitting them publicly, it felt as if a large weight had been taken off of my chest. After seeking out knowledge and studying this phenomenon, I decided it was time that I started a company that would investigate and do research on parapsychological paranormal entities. In October 2010, EPIC, Extreme Paranormal Investigators Consortium Incorporated, was born. I had formed a nonprofit organization and don't intend on making a single penny off this venture. I solicited the help of a half dozen people whom I brought into my team. These people had either some sort of psychic ability or experience as paranormal investigators. In addition, I took on two people who I am training to become paranormal investigators. I intended on continuing to learn as much as I can about metaphysics and parapsychology to better understand this ability. 
that I have through the operations of Epic Inc. and through classes at the Metaphysical Institute coupled with independent study. Over time, I had hoped to gain more control over these abilities and will be able to call upon them as I desire, instead of the abilities just manifesting seemingly on their own when they decided to do so. It has been 13 years since I first entered the field of paranormal science. I have learned from and investigated with the top names in the field of study. I have spent years studying sciences related to perceived paranormal activity and paranormal science itself. In 2017, I moved from Massachusetts to New Hampshire and ultimately changed the name of the group to Mount Washington Valley Spirit. Over the years, I've continued to exercise this retrocognition clairvoyance ability that I have. It hits me so often now that it is almost like a background noise until I focus on it. I have learned to use it when conducting paranormal investigations as one of my many tools that I have at my disposal. I use the ability as a guide, another tool and not the holy grail of the investigation. I am not as verbal as I once was about my ability as such things have quite the stigma tied to it. I use it silently. I somehow have the ability to put a picture to the electromagnetic energy around me. What once scared me is something that I now embrace like a family member. Please visit us online at www.mwvspirit.com where you can find our social media sites and blog. Thank you for listening to the Mount Washington Valley Spirit Podcast, where we don't like to be normal, we like to be paranormal.